Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Eric Franzen, stepping in today for Shannon Kemp, who is on vacation this week. We would like to thank you for joining us for this month's installment of the monthly DEMA International Webinar Series. The webinar series is designed to give our Enterprise Data World Conference attendees educational opportunities year-round. We are excited about the upcoming Enterprise Data World 2016 event, which will be held in San Diego, California, April 17th through 22nd. Registration is open for that event, so be sure to check out the details at enterprisedataworld.com. Today's webinar will be presented by DEMA Publications Director, Laura Sebastian Coleman, and she will be discussing big and little data quality. A couple of points to get us started. Due to the very large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you would like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the upper right-hand corner of the screen to enable that feature. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, which is different than chat. That you will find in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DAMA. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and any additional information that may come up during the webinar. And now a few words about our speaker. Laura Sebastian Coleman is Data Quality and Data Standards Center of Excellence Lead at Cigna. She has worked on data quality in large healthcare analytic data warehouses since 2003. She has implemented data quality metrics and reporting, launched and facilitated data quality working groups, contributed to data consumer training programs, and led efforts to establish data standards and to manage metadata for large analytic data warehouses. In 2009, she led a group of analysts at Optum in developing the original data quality assessment framework which is the basis for her book, Measuring Data Quality for Ongoing Improvement. That was a Morgan Kaufman publication. An active professional, Laura is DEMA Publications Director. In 2015, she, relieved, she received IAIDQ's Distinguished Member Award for her contributions to the International Association for Information and Data Quality. And with that, I will turn things over to Laura to start the presentation. Laura, hello and welcome. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate the introduction, and thanks to everyone who's attending. I know that all of us are busy, and so making a decision to, to take an hour out of your day to attend uh, a webinar like this is not always easy. I appreciate your being here. Um, I want to just add to the, the notes that Eric uh, shared in the introduction that a couple of influences on how I think about data quality, and these will come into play in, in, the, um, in the presentation. So my thinking on data quality has been influenced very strongly by the basic challenge of how to measure the quality of data. Uh, and the concept of measurement itself has led me to think about data in a different way from how I used to think about it. Problems of, of measurement are microcosms of problems of data definition and collection. So the other thing that's influenced me has been the demands of data warehousing and particularly the challenges of data integration where we have data defined in diverse ways and uh, we need to bring it together so that uh, data consumers can understand it in a similar way. I think as we move into the world of big data, the challenges are changing, but they are evolving in ways that uh, we can, in some, in some cases, anticipate and plan for, particularly when we talk about uh, integration. So with that, I'd like to get started on the content. And hang on one moment. Here we go. Um, so I want to review the problem that we're going to be talking about today. We know that we live in a world of intense technical innovation. And we can capture a tremendous amount of data in, in an incredibly short time with great speed through instruments that will tell us 
something about the content of that data. More importantly, we really want to use that data. We want to get value from the data. However, uh, we still face some of the basic challenges that have been around since people recognized the impact of prophecies on the creation of uh, high or, or poor quality data. So we have not mastered those fundamental uh, changes. Now, within healthcare, these, despite the fact that we have technological advances, much of the data that's collected is still collected through person-to-person -person contact. And we, when we talk about this data, it's not big data at all, it's, it's little data. So I'm going to be walking you guys through ways to think about data in old and new ways, and I hope that this will improve your, your approach to how to how to improve the quality of data in your organizations, regardless of whether you're dealing with, with uh, big data quality or little data quality. So first I'm going to walk through uh, some of the challenges within healthcare. So what we really want to get out of big data and what obstacles are in the way to getting there. Uh, then I want to step back from that for a moment with that context in mind and talk about the concepts of data and data quality to shed light on how to solve these problems. And then I'm going to make a couple of suggestions of things that I think can happen within healthcare to make good on the promises that uh, big data implies. So, so when we talk about data in, in healthcare, uh, as in other areas, we are, we are developing ways of both collecting and using data that are, are brand new and, and that change virtually on a daily basis. One of the big developments is that there are tons of applications, mobile apps and the like, that are aimed at helping people manage their health. And they have, these, these applications make big promises. They they promise uh, better decision making, higher levels of engagement, better levels of compliance. They offer ways to actually change how we live, how we manage our lifestyle choices, and therefore they imply that they can improve our health. They can prepare us to manage illnesses and help us manage those illnesses. And then for the system overall, they also promise that we can, we can do things like manage demand. So if you're headed for an emergency room that is already full, you might be redirected to an emergency room a few miles away that could help, uh, that where you would get care faster. In making these promises, there's the implication that we can actually uh, transform healthcare. And many of the articles on this subject imply that, that the train is already rolling along and that we, we, will, that we, that we must uh, get on it. So PricewaterhouseCoopers has published a very interesting white paper on healthcare delivery in the future. And they talk about the fundamental imperative to have digitally enabled uh, care. Um, the, the, this imperative and the availability of data, the ability to collect it, have uh, created major changes in how healthcare is being delivered and how it can be delivered. And this sounds almost, almost like science fiction when, when uh, writers say that uh, digital technology bridges time, distance, and the expectation gap between consumers and clin clinicians. So that's a pretty big promise. However, <laughs> the reality of healthcare is that oftentimes the system is, is not uh, working the, the way that we want it to and there are big obstacles in the way. So about six months ago there was an insurance uh, summit in Hartford and, and healthcare executives were trying to understand uh, why innovation in healthcare leads to higher costs. 
So in other areas, we have technological innovation, and that becomes a means of saving costs, but in healthcare, it often leads to higher costs. Um, one of the executives estimated that about 30% of healthcare costs uh, were due to inefficiencies. So we think about, you know, technology as a means of gaining efficiencies, but if we are uh, spending 30% of our money in an inefficient way, then we, we are not uh, realizing the benefits associated with innovation. Um, so another one of them lamented that many of the many of the uh, applications and drivers are, are encouraging people to take better care of their health, but it's easy to say that people should take care of their health, but it is not easy to actually make them uh, take care of their health. So, healthcare has, has the possibility of being transformed by bigger data and technological innovation. Uh, through healthcare analytics, but there are a lot of obstacles in the way. So the promise is based on the assumption that high quality data is available and that it is truly high quality, that it does represent the interactions between providers and, and patients in a meaningful way. What are some of the technological limitations on the healthcare system right now? One is legacy systems. So the um, most of the of the large healthcare companies have been around for uh, for decades, and they work based on older systems. Um, these systems can differ widely within organizations, and they certainly differ between organizations. The a second driver is that the medical profession providers, your doctors and and such, are are still not very uh, technologically enabled. So when we look at how we're trying to transition away from paper, uh, we realize that this has been a, a slow process. Much of healthcare is still, uh, you know, paper driven. Um, and when we look at in in 2008, which you know was only a few years back, only four percent of providers had uh, electronic health record systems. Or had, had a full electronic health record, and only 13% had a basic system. So when we think about when we think about that, we realize it's a slow transition to actually get the providers out in the field to be doing things in, a, in an electronic way. I was I was at the doctor just last week, and I found myself filling out paper forms that were exactly the same paper forms that I'd filled out the year before. So other factors that have influenced uh, the, the challenges with healthcare data quality is a, a lack of standards. Now, there are plenty of standard codes, there are plenty of uh, directives for um, standardization, but people have applied these inconsistently or they haven't had enough information to, to apply them in, in a way that improves the overall quality of the data. And there haven't been any standards actually directed at data quality itself. There are, there are standards for, for other aspects of healthcare. I want to give an example of this and talk about a group um, called Academy Health. So about a year and a half ago, I was involved with a, a meeting run by Academy Health who is a group of academics who are looking to improve um, information around the quality of data that is gathered in non-clinical settings. So what they want to do is understand if they are using this data to understand a phenomenon within the health uh, care system or to understand uh, details of a disease, how much confidence should they have in the data. Um, and they recognize that as more data is collected and is made available through research data warehouses, 
uh, they could potentially have a, a rich source of data that they could use to do analyses um, that, are not that do not necessarily require clinical trials. So clinical trials are, are expect expensive and they want to they wanna understand how to, how to get at some questions through other means. So because uh, academics and researchers are using these sources of data, most of which come from large um, commercial uh, payers in the healthcare system, they're trying to develop standards where they can, they can uh, numerically express the quality of data. What they found is that there are a number of factors that can cause a misrepresentation of certain clinical events. And these include systems that are inflexible in their design, so you cannot capture the events consistently. Um, coding practices within, within hospitals and other provider settings uh, where people would make different choices about how to represent those events. And then gaps in the standards themselves. So they gave an example of screening for high blood pressure in children. Uh, clinicians were directed to screen for high blood pressure. So that meant they actually were taking the blood pressure of children and, and trying to understand whether um, there was any risk of the, of the children getting high blood pressure. And they were asked after the initial screening to continue to monitor the children. After this data had been collected for a period of time and researchers looked at it, what they found was it appeared that children were had, were increasingly at risk for high blood pressure, and they were surprised by this finding. But when they actually went back and did a records review, they showed that it wasn't that children were actually at higher risk, but that there was a, a misuse of the hypertension, uh, high blood pressure diagnosis code. Because there was not a diagnosis code for considering hypertension, they were unable, they, the doctors were unable to record what they were actually doing, and the data appeared to show that something different was happening from what was actually taking place. So this was just one example of the, the kinds of gaps that can evolve when we do not have the standards or when the choices in how to collect data are influenced um, by factors that, don't, that, that may lead to confusion. So when we think about healthcare, healthcare is about taking care of people. Most people who are in healthcare are, are driven by their concern for other people. So we have a lot of room for interpretation. <laughs> um, and, and those interpretive uh, factors may influence how symptoms are read and and how we represent them, and as those choices are made, we might reach different conclusions about what story the data is actually telling us. So I'm going to go back, I'm going to step back from, from having set up the problem and talk about characteristics of data that we might be able to use to improve the situation. So most of us assume we know what, what data is, but it's always good to start with definitions because when we explore them, we can see other facets of the topic that we're thinking about. So when we go back to the beginning, uh, data is, has a Latin root. It is the past participle of to give. And if you guys are um, in, in math or engineering, you recognize that, that data is equivalent to your givens. Um, in, the, in modern parlance, we talk about data as facts and statistics, and we think of them as used for analysis or used for reference. So data has a level of objectivity to it. Of all these definitions, my uh, preferred one is the ISO definition because it also acknowledges the level to which we rely on information technology and systems 
when we start to think about uh, what, how data is created. So ISO defines data as, quote, reinterpretable representation of information in a formalized manner suitable for communication, interpretation, or processing. I realize that's a mouthful, but it is really worth thinking about each, each word. So data needs to be in, interpreted. It is representing something. It has a formal structure. And the reason for it having a formal structure is so that it can be used to communicate, so it can be used so people can interpret it in a consistent manner, and also so it can be processed. It can move from system to system. When we, when we think about data conceptually, we understand that it's trying to tell the truth about the world. But we also should understand that in order to get to that truth, we have to make a set of decisions about creating that data. So we choose what characteristics to represent. We choose the form in which we will represent them. And we need to be very clear in, in those what those choices are so that other people can understand the data itself and what it represents. We also know that the driver of collecting all this data is so that people can use it. And especially in this day and age, as people realize how reliant we are on data itself to, to run our businesses and to learn more about our world. So the uses of data also imply a set of expectations about what, what condition the data should be in and therefore about its quality. We also should keep in mind that in today's world, we call practically everything data. And we do not create data in this, in, in, we do not necessarily create data with usage in mind. And that becomes, that becomes a problem. So if we think about the history of measurement and the, and the historical context of data, we realize that our ideas about data are driven by two different places where data is created and used. So in science, we create data. And in commerce, we create data. But we have, we have different goals and different approaches. Um, if we think about science, science is focusing largely on measurement and, and observation as a means to create knowledge and advance knowledge. When you're a scientist, you actually plan for your data and you test that data to see that it's accurate and complete and properly calibrated and that your results are reproducible. That's the foundation of, of science. So it's always testing and retesting. In science, data is truly a product a product of the process, and so the process needs to uh, ensure the quality of the data. Otherwise, you lose credibility. Commerce, on the other hand, creates measurements to achieve goals. So if you are the baker in town and you want to sell your bread at a fair price and, and make a profit, you need to know how much how, how big a loaf you're going to sell for what price, and you need to know what your competitor is going to sell for. So when commerce is using measurement and creating data, it's, it's less planned and more accidental. The, the goal is to sell and make a profit, and the, and the data supports that goal. So in that sense, data is a byproduct of commerce. And Historically, the, the quality of data has not been an end, an end in itself when we think about data in commerce, whereas the opposite is true in science. So if we try to visualize the differences, we realize that sci a scientific approach is both more fluid in terms of what it's going to look at, but then ultimately um, more strict once it has reached its conclusion. Whereas commerce assumes that data is fixed and it doesn't actually want to do 
the work to make it fixed. So most of us are in organizations that take much more of a, a commercial view of data than a scientific view of data. That said, our ideas about data are usually based on our scientific notion that we are somehow collecting facts about the real world and that uh, in, in doing that, we, we have a connection to reality that should be stable and should be reliable and in, in which we should be confident. So we get frustrated when data is of low quality because we assume it should be of, of better quality. When we think about how we create data, there's this, this cyclical process. We create data because we're observing the world in one way or another, and we make choices to capture that, that those observations and represent the world. That results in data, a condensed form of our knowledge about the world. We then want to use that data, and we assume that it should be fit for our purposes of use. Why do we assume that? Because it's, if the data represents the world, if we know that we're taking measurements of the mileage between cities or the temperature of the water, we assume that, that um, our process for representing those things is effective. And in, in many cases, it is, because we can all agree on what a temperature is or what a mile is, the challenges come in if we're missing some of the pieces. So if we know what the temperature is but we don't know what scale it's in, then we have a data quality problem. If we know the distance, if we have a number associated with the distance but not a, not a unit of measure and we, and we misunderstand what unit of measure is used, then we have a data quality problem. We can also make bad choices about representation or the, the knowledge of those choices might be lost. In all those cases, we run into a conflict between what we expect and what we actually have. So this, this problem becomes more complicated when we start to talk about big data. And even in science, uh, people are struggling with inconsistencies in, in data, unexpected inconsistencies. So about a year ago, Science News reported the challenges that researchers, scientific researchers were having with uh, using big data. And they reported, among other things, that just tracking the data is challenging and then sharing the data is challenging um, because oftentimes people don't know the origin of the data or um, the ways in which the data was, was collected. Now in science, this is, this is fundamental to the process because if you cannot, um, if, you, if you do not know where your data came from, then you cannot replicate your own, you know, you cannot re replicate your results. One of the things that I found most interesting in this article was it recognized that even the way we look at data will influence um, the ability to replicate results. So the scientists reported that the tools that are used to analyze complex data sets are as important as the data themselves. And choosing a, one computer program over another may in fact end up uh, bringing about different results and different conclusions, which is, is even more uh, to the point. So the inability to reproduce results has been a, a challenge in science, and scientists have begun studying the factors that influence uh, reproducibility. And they've talked about what they call the butterfly effect, which if any of you are familiar with with this concept, it basically says that you can have very small changes in your, your beginning conditions, and those changes may have very large influences on the resulting, uh, the resulting conclusions. Um, so, for example, 
the, the, the story that's always told to illustrate the butterfly effect and why it's called the butterfly effect is that if a butterfly flaps its wings in Brazil uh, on a Tuesday, this could cause a hurricane in France on, on, a, uh, on a Wednesday. So it's that idea. Um, small changes can have big effects. So researchers have been looking at the doctor-patient relationship and tried to understand how this butterfly effect works on that relationship. So earlier I said, you know, any doctor-patient interaction is a series of interpretations and recording those interpretations. They looked at 12 different factors that can influence clinical decision making. Um, they're listed on this slide. I won't go through them in detail, but you can see that they fall into these four categories of decision features, situational factors, characteristics of the decision maker, and individual differences. So within each of these, um, you can have different initial con conditions. When they looked across these, they saw that there were over 20,000 combinations that could represent the initial conditions of an experiment or an interaction. So that's a huge number. <laughs> that's a huge number. Um, and if, if we think about that, then the problem of accuracy becomes uh, totally different. Because when we're creating data within the healthcare system, there are essentially thousands of opportunities to influence the process of decision making and how to treat the patient. And if we have that combined with older technology that doesn't adapt to new protocols or conditions, or for which we don't actually have clear standards or those standards are applied inconsistently, then there's a lot of room for variation within the system. And when we have variation within the system, we have different levels of uh, quality and different levels of reliability for the data. So how do we move beyond this? I'd like to propose three different uh, facets of an approach. And I'll, I'll talk in depth on each of these, but the, the first is recognizing that there is variation and that it may be possible to use this variation to improve the system. The second is to, to think about how do we reduce variation uh, within the system, variation that causes noise or actually interferes with our ability to act uh, in, in our own best interest. And then finally, I'll come back to one of the fundamentals of, of uh, data quality, and that is to recognize data quality as a product of the system and, and take steps to plan for higher quality data throughout the system. So the first one, recognizing variation. So usually when we talk about variation within a system, our urge is to say, oh, we must get rid of the variation in order for, in order for the system to run smoothly. However, they're based on what, what we look at with respect to how clinicians look at patients, some of that variation may actually be good. If, uh, if we have two doctors and each of them, each of them brings a different perspective to a problem, then they can learn from each other and they may together be able to come up with a better solution than either one of them could come up with individually. So variation may have meaning. It may add to our ability to understand a situation. And if it does, and we can gain knowledge through those differences, then that becomes a mechanism by which to provide feedback to the system and therefore thereby in, improve the system. When we think about why we want to take advantage of healthcare analytics and evidence-based medicine, this is exactly what we want to do, right? We can see if we look at um, large numbers of claims, medical claims related to the same uh, diseases or conditions, and we can understand 
how the different kinds of treatments produced outcomes, then we might be able <clears throat> to find within those various uh, approaches, we might be able to find which ones work best and which ones uh, do not work as well. And that can become a, a very good way of improving treatments overall. So variation itself may be helpful and can be a starting point for uh, improving how, how we do treatments. That said, there are also reasons when we, when we can understand variation, there are reasons then to reduce variation. And in areas where variation may cause a quality problem, we would, we would want uh, to take those steps. So one of those steps is enforcing data quality standards within, within healthcare. Uh, as I alluded to earlier with the example of Academy Health, it, the, their exploration of large sets of claim data have shown that there are significant differences in the way that we record events and significant differences in the way we process claims and the like. So it's hard to tell, given all of those things, how good the data is. And we could um, and we can improve it. So when we think about this in relation to big data, um, we see that one of the advantages is that more data can be collected through instruments rather than uh, relying on human interpretation for things that can be objectively measured, right? So if we think about um, things like Fitbits or uh, other devices that allow us to uh, collect healthcare biometric data, um, and if we know the, the device itself, and if the device is well calibrated, then we can reduce the ambiguity of the data collection. We can collect it in a much more consistent way. And despite the fact that in many respects, healthcare needs to be uh, more technologically adept, you know, the provider's offices could, could um, up the game and the like, there's certainly been a movement for um, the use of apps and the use of devices to collect uh, biometric data that, that is really in improving the collection of that data. So, for example, in PricewaterhouseCoopers reported that 28% of consumers have at least one health-related application on their tablets or smartphones. So people are engaging with these applications, and, and that had increased, uh, you know, more than doubled in three years. And I'd be interested to know even now, you know, a year later, what, what the statistics on that are. As importantly, about two-thirds of doctors said they would be willing to prescribe an app. So that means they would scrutinize what they think, you know, the best app is to provide guidance to their patients, and they would, they would be willing to prescribe that. If we can be collecting this data and then integrating it into the electronic medical records, then, then we, have a, uh, we have a big opportunity to have reliable, well-defined data focused on particular patient needs uh, included in those electronic health records, which then could move from physician to physician as people uh, look for different kinds of care or different kinds of treatments. So this process and these kinds of devices enable uh, feedback about the data from both providers and patients. This is another advantage. So if you are looking at a paper medical record and everything's written down and you don't have your own copy, you're not going to be able to find errors. But if you have your own electronic medical record and you see an, an error, if you see a problem or something missing, then you have the ability to provide that feedback. So that can, can reduce errors within, within, uh, within records and um, can also enable consumers to have a better view of their health. 
So the, these are some of the things that will allow us to reduce variation where variation is causing uh, problems. And also will, you know, be truly taking advantage of these new means of managing data, collecting data. Um, my final, my final point is again harkens back to uh, some fundamentals of data quality. So, in in 1996, Richard Wang published an article on data quality in which he said we should we should treat data as a product of processes. And, I, and that rallying cry is, is still important. We have to recognize that if we're going to take advantage of data to learn more, then we have to have trustworthy and reliable data. And particularly within healthcare, data is not a secondary thing. If we don't have data, we, we give up the opportunity to improve outcomes. So we really need to rethink the system and focus on ensuring that throughout the healthcare process, we collect accurate, complete data. Whether that data is our standard healthcare data when you go to the physician's office, or whether it is biometric data that's collected through some device. And we do have an understanding of what we mean by high quality data. It is clearly defined, we know what the data represents. It represents unambiguously that characteristic of the real world. It's consistently collected through reliable processes. So if we have a device to collect the data, then that device is well calibrated and, and it, it is, um, it is uh, sending data at the proper frequency and the like. If we have a process, a more manual process, then the people who execute that process are well trained, they understand how to apply standards and the like. And then the standards themselves are comprehensible and usable. So the processes and systems that we build to create healthcare data need to be designed from the beginning with the data itself in mind. And the industry needs to recognize that even though it is a people-to-people -people industry in many ways, the people on both sides of that equation are relying on the information that they exchange to, to get to the place where they want to be, which is to help people lead better lives, to be healthier, and to have a greater sense of security. So that's my pitch for better data quality. Uh, within the slides, I've also included a set of references to some of the articles that uh, influenced the, my thinking here. Um, I would like to draw your attention, for, especially for those in the healthcare industry, to the PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, white paper on the healthcare industry and also to the Consumer Reports um, article on healthcare and how consumer cho choices are influencing healthcare. So with that, Eric, I'll bring it to a close and uh, I'd be glad to start on the Q&A portion of the, of, of the webinar. Well, Laura, thank you so much and, and thank you for the thorough presentation. And um, while we wait for some more uh, questions to come in, I do want to uh, remind everyone, please use the Q&A box, that's the lower right portion of your screen, rather than the chat window. Uh, also, don't, if you're madly trying to uh, write down all of those URLs in front of you, um, please know that we will post those in a clickable format uh, on the dataversity.net website when we post the recording of this session and the slides. Um, which is a good opportunity to remind everyone we will be posting the recorded webinar and slides to dataversity.net within two business days. And all of the registrants of today's webinar will receive a follow-up email to let you know how to access that material and when it's been posted. Uh, also, just a quick reminder that you will be able to meet Laura in person at Enterprise Data World 2016 which will be held in San Diego, California, April 17th through 22nd. Registration is open for that event. 
and details are available at enterprisedataworld.com. All right, so let's see if we have any questions coming in yet. Not yet. All right. You've thoroughly filled everyone's brains, Laura. <laughs> wow. Here we go. <laughs> here's, here's a question. Um, quality data depends upon the participation of medical personnel. Given competing priorities on their time, how can data collection become more streamlined? Yeah, that is, um, that is a very good question. And part of, um, part of what I see as an opportunity is to collect more data through devices. Um, I'll, give an, I'll give an example. But, um, when I was in my 20s, I had my first EKG. And the process of setting up the EKG took, it felt like, about 15 minutes. And then, um, of course, the process of, you know, getting off of the EKG was, was equally burdensome. I had an EKG uh, earlier this month, and the improvement in the way that those, that, that is administered is, is largely a, a technological improvement. The device is smaller, the process for setting it up is much quicker, setting it up and, and taking it down, and the results themselves are, are much more reliable. So when we talk about certain kinds of measurements, I think the opportunity is for uh, better technology to collect data. And I think, you know, many of you who have gone to the doctor had measurement procedures, you, you know, you probably can, um, cite examples in your own lives where, uh, where that's the case. Um, on the downside is, is um, the danger of our physicians being uh, over, overworked in some cases and, you know, having very high demand. And not only, not only the physicians themselves, but many people who are part of, um, you know, the provider uh, offices and the like are under pressure to do a lot in a short period of time. And this raises challenges. Um, I think the, the only way to overcome that problem is first to, to recognize, again, that the data that we're collecting is extremely important to improving the system and changing the changing the orientation from data as something that you, that you collect in order to submit a claim to data as something that has a life beyond just paying that claim. I, I don't know exactly how to, how to solve that problem because I don't work in a, in a medical office, but I do know that we, we, need, we need, in a sense, to, to turn that ship. And it may be that, you know, getting, getting a different kind of participation from the, the medical community may come about from within that community themselves if, if they can uh, make the connection between the, the data that they create and the ways in which that data can be used. So I don't have the answer, but I do think, I do think it's a question worth exploring. Yeah. Um, next question, can you speak a little bit to the maturity of the healthcare area in general in using big data to get useful insights to improve people's health? Is there any country already advanced in this area? So, I, I think overall, there is a, there is a good deal of maturity in using big data to get insights. I, I know about five or six years ago when people first started talking about um, big data and data lakes and, and these different ways of pulling together, um, pulling together disparate data in order, to, uh, in order to understand 
in order to gain different insights about the healthcare system, um, that was, you know, five or six years ago, people were kind of struggling to figure out how to do that. But now, most of the healthcare payers have teams of data scientists who are looking at big data. Uh, there are uh, university programs in data science with, uh, with the healthcare specialty. So there's been a good deal of, of movement in this, in this direction. I think the, the challenges of actually having confidence in the, in the quality of the data are, are being overcome somewhat when, we, again, when we, have, when we have data that is collected in, by devices and the definition of what it represents is very clear, you can really dive into that data. Um, when we look at medical claim data that is collected in more traditional ways, then it, it needs to be used with caution. So I, I've seen changes within the field. I'm, I'm not directly, you know, doing healthcare analytics myself, but I've seen changes within the field of healthcare analytics that are very exciting. Um, the data itself, we still, I think we still need to work on, especially the data that's collected in more traditional ways. Mm -hmm. And the are, part are of the question was, oh, sorry, part of the question was no, about, you know, is, is one country, you know, is there one country doing more of this than others? And I, I can't speak to that, but I do know that there's a lot of international conversation about, um, about how to use this data. So, for example, the Academy Health reference that I talked about, the folks that are part of that are engaged in conversation not only within the U.S. but across international borders. So th there's a lot, I think there's a lot to be gained, and people are truly trying to take a scientific approach to it. Okay. Um, are you aware of specific organizations that are developing data quality standards for healthcare? The questioner is looking for industry guidance on how we can confirm that we have quality data or surface data quality issues. Yeah, so the Academy Health example that I gave is, is the one that I'm most familiar with um, from, a, from a healthcare perspective. Um, and there's an organization um, called High core, I believe, and I'll, I'll follow up and make sure I've got that right, who are, who are part of, of driving that forward. Um, so, and, and I'm, I'm not going to remember um, the individual's names, but I will look them up. I know one of our IAIDQ members was very active in, in this process. So I can send that to you, Eric, that information, and have you um, maybe share it when you share the uh, the rest of the webinar materials? Sure. Sure. Um, are you aware of any efforts to create a uh, data model for healthcare? In area, it, it, the questioner says, in any area, a data model can be a foundation upon which to build the analytics and also serves as a way of seeing which data are available or not and helps thinking helps think of getting the missing data, et cetera. Are you aware of any efforts like that? Yeah, so I know, you know, several of the warehouse vendors have created industry standard models. So, for example, um, you know, Teradata has an industry standard healthcare model. Um, within uh, the two organizations for which I've worked um, in healthcare, Optum and, and uh, Cigna, um, there are, you know, those, each of those organizations has created an overall model. Um, what I'm not familiar with is a, a vendor neutral healthcare model. And I think I, I agree with the um, with the the person who asked the question that a data model is a really good beginning point for establishing expectations for quality and establishing data quality standards. Um, I'm a I'm a firm believer in um, having a data model as as a way to 
uh, have the conversations and then also as a way of capturing the um, capturing the uh, results of those conversations about quality expectations. So while there isn't a, while there isn't to my knowledge a vendor neutral industry standard, I I think anybody working in this space should have a working data model if they want to improve the quality of their data. Hmm. Uh, earlier you mentioned high quality data. From your perspective, what are the thresholds of describing data sets as high quality? So I could I could talk for another hour on this question. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> um, so I'll talk a little bit, uh, I'll, I'll talk about two things. Uh, one, my definition of what it means for data to be of high quality, and then uh, my thoughts on thresholds. So high, high quality data, and I'm gonna, I, mean, I am gonna just go back um, to, my slide on um, my slide on uh, representational effectiveness and fitness for purpose. So most discussions of data quality start with fitness for purpose, and they say you know the quality of data is uh, judged by the consumer of the data and whether the data is fit for the purpose the consumer wants it for. That's been a kind of standard way of talking about data quality that comes from, from Richard Wang and Tom Redman and uh, Larry English, other, other thought leaders in data quality. Um, and I think that is the place where the quality of data gets to judge. But I also think that we need to talk we need to consider representational effectiveness and for those of you who are familiar with um, with uh, thoughts on this um, Malcolm Crawley talks about this concept of, of representational effectiveness so why are they connected they're connected because if you're going to use data you're, you're probably going to use it because you want, you, you want to explore what it represents. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna study global warming, right, if you wanna reach conclusions about global warming, then you need data about the temperature of the earth and changes in weather patterns and all of those things in order to um, do an analysis of global warming. If you wanna improve the treatment of diabetes, then you need data about, uh, the treatments that have been used and the outcomes that have been derived from those treatments in, in order to do your analysis. So there's a direct relationship between these two things. And our expectations of fitness for purpose are directly related to what the data represents. So when we talk about then measuring that, we need, we need to understand both pieces. We need to understand how well the data represents the thing it's supposed to represent. And then we can, and then we can say, ah, it's fit for my purpose. Um, there can be many different purposes for the same data. Um, the classic example is address data. If you have all of your customers' addresses and you wanna do a, a, a physical mailing, then those addresses need to be accurate at that time. <laughs> if you have all your customers' addresses and you wanna do trend analysis on you know, your sales five years ago and your sales six years ago, then you need not only the addresses as they are today, but you may need the historical addresses. So when we start to think about that, we get in this conversation about what do you expect from the data? What are, what are you using it for? And, the, and then you can set standards for um, levels of completeness, levels of validity, levels of accuracy, however you want to approach that from a dimensional point of view. Um, so when I think about high quality data, I think about data that you've had, you've had a conversation with your customers about what they are using that data for 
you have objective measures for the data, and you can share those measurements with your, with your data consumers so they can then judge um, whether they can use the data or not, or whether it's fit for their purpose. So you need a lot of pieces in order to get to a threshold. There isn't just one threshold. Um, you need, in a sense, knowledge about the use, knowledge about what the data represents. All right. Laura, thank you so much. It is now the end of the hour. I'm afraid that is all the time we have. Thank you all for your questions, for tuning in today. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful day, and uh, hopefully we will see many of you at uh, Enterprise Data World in April. Um, we look forward to seeing you there and online at dataversity.net and in future webinars. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eric.